Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Goldenberg. Uh, so once again, I'm Richard Sowery. Uh, I'm going to start the talk by telling you a little bit about myself because there's some uh, urologists in Vancouver who I haven't met yet and uh, certainly some on the periphery who I also haven't met. So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself and how I ended up being in Vancouver working with Dr. Goldenberg and Gleave and So and Group. Um, my uh, work is sponsored by the AUA Foundation Scholarship as well as the Prostate Center here. And uh, I'm in the Department of Urological Sciences, uh, both uh, part of the Division of uh, Urology of the Department of Surgery before and now the new Department of Urological Sciences. So it's an exciting time to be here in Vancouver. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is Advances in Prostate Cancer Chemotherapy, the dawn of a new era. It's a little bit melodramatic, but some of the points that I want to make is that things are changing rapidly over the last five years in chemotherapy for hormone refractory prostate cancer. And in many ways, it's an exciting time. There's many developments on the horizon, and uh, for the first time over the last few years, there's a significant uh, potential impact being made in this patient population. And I want to bring home some of the points that I think have been missed with the review of the trials that came out in the New England Journal over the last few years and show you a little bit about where things are heading in that direction. So to tell you a little bit about myself, this is me at the AUA meeting in San Francisco. Uh, I met a couple of gentlemen there who I was talking to, and uh, the man to my left there kept asking me for more free Viagra samples through our conversation over and over again. And uh, the man to the right kept saying, Viagra? What's that? Viagra? Hey, Bill, what's that? So uh, after I'm done my fellowship next June, I'll be looking for a job. Uh, this is a picture of me in Portugal there, uh, uh, looking around all over the world. Um, Kingston, Ontario is where I did my training. I did my bachelor's degree there and I did a master's in immunology and then I continued with medical school and, and uh, residency training. It's a nice, uh, nice place to live. There's a, a picture of the courthouse downtown. You can see the Cataraqui River up on the horizon. Uh, Kingston was actually the capital of Canada when it merged from Upper and Lower Canada and was the capital between 1841 and 1844, which is a little known factoid. Um, anybody else know what the other capitals of Canada were before Ottawa? You can just shout them out. It wasn't Surrey, Dr. McCracken. I heard that. Uh, you know. uh, but uh, anyway, Montreal. Uh, pardon me? New Westminster. New Westminster. Oh, maybe of Western. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, Montreal, Ottawa, uh, uh, also uh, Quebec City before moving to Ottawa in 1867. So here's a picture of uh, Kingston where I did my training. The, uh, the central portion of buildings is, uh, is a hospital area. Um, uh, the leafy green hill off to the, uh, the right of the slide there is where the principal's house is. Principal of Queens gets a beautiful uh, spot right on the hill there. Um, and uh, the Center for Advanced Urological Research is right down at the bottom. If anyone goes to visit Kingston, the clinical trials unit is in one of the homes along that street, as well as the uh, Urology Research Institute in 2005 they started there. Dr. Morales is the first director of that center. Uh, being in Kingston, it's hard not to get involved in research. The guys are very supportive there and uh, throughout, you know, they encourage me and, and uh, encourage me to look into Vancouver to stay in Canada to do research because of the exciting things that were happening in Vancouver with the Prostate Center and the group here. And so Dr. Morales is very encouraging. I appreciate that for him showing me. Here's uh, one of the guys I came to work with here in Kingston. That's uh, Dr. Martin Gleave. Uh, you may not know, but at the uh, CUA in Halifax, he was the trauma surgeon there for the uh, banquet, and he was doing a very careful extraction of a lobster from a, a crazy accident that happened there. So let's, let's talk briefly about uh, hormone refractory prostate cancer patients and the three groups of patients in general that you'll see. Group one is those who have failed uh, biochemically and their PSA is rising. Group two patients are asymptomatic patients who have positive bone scans. And group three patients are symptomatic patients with positive bone scan. I'd like to take a quick straw poll from people as to what patients in your practice you're currently referring for chemotherapy at this point. Is anyone referring patients in group one to medical oncology for an opinion? Is anyone referring patients in group two, those who are asymptomatic but have positive bone scans? So we have a few of the oncologists tellingly. Um, and group three, who would refer patients in group three? Okay, we have some lack of involvement, but uh, most people would agree that group three are the patients that we're referring right now to medical oncology. And as urologists, we're wary of new treatments, and sometimes that's good, because you want proven therapies with evidence-based medicine before referring your patients for potentially harmful treatments unless they're gonna, they're gonna help them in the situation of laser vasectomy, of course, probably not any better than the, the gold standard. But we also don't wanna be too hesitant to refer our patients to treatments that may help them and improve their quality of life and also improve their overall survival. So we should take a chance at some point if the evidence is suggesting that this may be helpful for them. 
I'm going to structure this talk into three main sections. The first section, I'm going to discuss the evolution of chemotherapy for hormone refractory prostate cancer and talk about what's happened over the last 15 years. I'm going to briefly go through mechanisms of chemo resistance to get a, a general understanding of what's happening with second-line therapies that are coming out and things to look for in terms of uh, developments that will overcome chemo resistance. I'm also going to talk about a few uh, second-line therapies that have been in clinical trials that are showing some promise and show what's to, to hold in the future. Talking about uh, chemotherapy for hormone refractory prostate cancer and what's happened, what do you do when patients' PSA is rising like in this graph or they're symptomatic? Well, everyone remembers back uh, in hormone refractory prostate cancer treatment years ago, remember vinblastine or estramustine? Who, of course, can forget mitoglazone, however I pronounce that? Uh, of course, it's all forgettable for us because uh, uh, response rates were very low. And until uh, the last five years or eight years with uh, mitoxantrone data, there wasn't a lot available in terms of chemotherapeutics. Here's a review going back to 1993 where they reviewed 26 trials published between 1987 and 1991, just before the PSA era. They indicated that there was an overall response rate of 8.7% overall, and suggested that there was promise in the vinblastine estramustine combination, but this is only in the area of a 10% to 12% response rate at best. Another difficulty was that in the pre-PSA era, it makes assessment and documentation of response a significant challenge for clinical trials. Let's talk a little bit about response rates and how you assess this in phase two and phase three clinical trials in this patient population. It's good to know that a minority of patients have measurable disease in terms of visceral metastasis or tumor bulk, which is the common outcome measure for trials in oncology with response rates and new agents. There's a lack of established criteria for judging response and treatment of disease that was largely evident by bone scan only. And the question always comes up, are patients with visceral metastasis represent of hormone refractory prostate cancer patients in general, the vast majority of which have bone scan positive disease? There's a quote from this review, which is interesting to read, that chaos will continue to reign when the efficacy of one drug is reported to be zero to 85%. When investigators continue to include stable disease findings in the so-called objective response category, thereby intimating that significant prostate cancer cell death has occurred. So that takes us to the PSA era, and what's changed? What has changed is that response to agents in clinical trials are beginning to be measured or began to be measured and reported in terms of PSA response. Is PSA a marker for survival? It's a bit controversial. There have been several phase two trials showing that a PSA uh, decrement of up to 50% does correlate with an increased survival. So there is some phase two evidence suggestive of that, but it's not a surrogate marker for survival. In terms of how to use PSA response in these trials, in 1999 there was a consensus conference where they defined a partial response as a minimum of a drop of 50% PSA, which you need to confirm with a second value four weeks later, in the absence of anything happening to the patient in terms of clinical or radiographic disease progression. In contemporary use, PSA has become a standard method to screen for activity in phase two trials, Although, as mentioned, it's not a validated surrogate marker for survival in phase three trials, although there is even data for that. We're going to start by talking about mitoxantrone. This goes back to uh, the mid to late 90s and the developments in that. A Canadian trial by uh, uh, Dr. Tannock um, was the first to show that mitoxantrone may be effective in this patient population. Um, this is a paper from uh, 1996. This is a Canadian trial. Many centers were involved, including here in Vancouver. Uh, it was a phase two trial with 161 patients. One thing to keep in mind with this study when you look at the data is that pain was a prerequisite for enrollment in this study. So these patients had pain. That's group three of the original patients that we talked about. The primary endpoint that they were looking at was palliative response based on a questionnaire. And patients that got mitoxantrone had a 29% palliative response compared to a 12% for those with prednisone, which is the control group. A secondary endpoint that they looked at was that they did not increase their analgesic use, again, looking at palliative response data. Most patients that responded in this study had an improvement both in quality of life and they had a decrease in PSA. So PSA did correlate with response in terms of palliation. Sure. Go back 
Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it may be because this is the first uh, getting into larger scale trial with mitoxantrone, and the next was the planned phase three if there was a potential benefit in survival. Um, I don't know the answer as to why it was phase two, 161. And I guess the, because I, I often think of it as a phase three trial, but I said the registration of the drug um, because of an efficacy endpoint. So a phase three trial is an efficacy endpoint. In this case, it was all in life. So maybe in retrospect, you consider that to be a phase three endpoint now, whereas then they weren't sure that they would get registration for it uh, because it had been done before. Right. So it's interesting. Right. So uh, uh, in this study, uh, uh, phase two, uh, duration of palliation was 43 versus 18 weeks, and they showed no difference in overall survival. Mitoxantrone was very well tolerated, and keep this in mind for later when we discuss about how these fit into treatment. Five patients in the mitoxantrone group had possible cardiac toxic toxicity, and only 1% though febrile neutropenia. An interesting point is that it was a crossover design, meaning if a patient was on prednisone and they were failing to respond, they could cross over into the mitoxantrone group, and 50 patients in the trial did that, 10 of which have ultimately responded to mitoxantrone. But as a result of this crossover design, the study was very underpowered to assess survival. Some people do think that mitoxantrone may have a survival benefit, but it wasn't indicated, and it wasn't indicated in this trial because of the underpowered nature of the study. Another study came along which was designed as a phase three with 242 patients uh, from uh, Dr. Kantoff out of Boston. This was published in 1999 looking at mitoxantrone. This study was powered to detect a 50% improvement in overall survival as the primary endpoint. Slightly different patient population, however, where greater than one third of them had no pain on enrollment, which is different than the Canadian mitoxantrone study. Keep that in mind when you interpret the results of this study. The primary outcome looking at survival showed no difference, 12.6 versus 12.3 months. There was a slight difference in time to progression though, which was statistically significant, 3.7 months in the mitoxantrone group compared with 2.3 months in the prednisone group. There was a, a, an indication that PSA was associated with a longer survival. If you had a higher than 50% decrease in your PSA, you did have a slightly better survival. Again, mitoxantrone very well tolerated, similar to the other group, about a 5% grade 3 or 4 cardiac dysfunction toxicity. The study's 50% improvement in overall survival is perhaps overly optimistic, and so that's one of the reasons that it was probably not shown in this study. It wasn't as large as the docetaxel studies that came out a few years ago. The summary of mitoxantrone is that because of these trials, it became approved by the US FDA for the palliative treatment of symptomatic prostate cancer, even though the second trial, as mentioned, many of the patients did not have pain on enrollment. There was no improvement in overall survival, but this is possibly due to the design of the studies and that they were underpowered, the placebo group being compared to prednisone, not compared to true placebo as well. It was very well tolerated, and it was thought that this would be a very useful control arm in future phase three trials, and that's why we see mitoxantrone come up again in the subsequent trials. So evolution number two is the taxanes and the trials that everyone has seen uh, over the last couple of years, uh, but we'll review the, the salient points of those trials. The first one was TAX327 here, uh, again with Dr. Tannock and a uh, group including uh, Dr. Chi and uh, Vancouver was a, a site investigator too. Uh, this was published in October 2004, looking at docetaxel plus prednisone compared to mitoxantrone plus prednisone. This is the largest uh, randomized trial for metastatic prostate cancer patients yet. Phase three trial, 1,006 patients. There are three arms to the study. Patients were placed either on docetaxel every three weeks in prednisone, docetaxel every week in prednisone, or mitoxantrone every three weeks in prednisone, the third group established by the previous trials. Phase two data wasn't clear as to whether docetaxel would be more effective every three weeks or every week, and that was the reason for the two arms, the two initial arms of the study. The patients in this group, let's look at who they were and so how we can apply the data to these patients. 45% of these had, patients had pain. So keep in mind when we talk about which patients we'd refer for docetaxel chemotherapy at the start, 55% of the patients in the TAX327 data had no pain on enrollment. 90% of them had bony mets in keeping with uh, uh, metastatic prostate patients. 23% had visceral metastasis. 
everyone's seen this graph before, and the skeptic would say, well, the, the curves don't split that much, and there's a marginal difference between the two. Why should I send my patients for potentially harmful treatment if there's a minimal benefit in survival? Again, let's keep in mind that mitoxantrone possibly has a survival benefit, that the studies were underpowered to show that, and so this is not compared to placebo control, this is compared to mitoxantrone group. The survival benefit was 18.9 months for docetaxel group compared to mitoxantrone at 16.5 months. And this is for the every three week docetaxel group. There wasn't a survival benefit shown compared to mitoxantrone for the weekly docetaxel group. This is a summary of the, the, uh, the, the data. Uh, PSA response in the three weekly docetaxel group was 45% compared to 32% in the three weekly mitoxantrone. Pain response rate was also better in the three weekly docetaxel, 35% compared to mitoxantrone of 22%. So docetaxel offers a survival benefit, may be indicated by PSA, although still controversial, and also is, is better than mitoxantrone in terms of palliation. The side effect profile, however, indicates that uh, the docetaxel group had higher incidence of side effects, grade 3 and 4 neutropenia, 32% compared with 22% in the mitoxantrone group, and serious adverse effects, usually indicating something that they needed to be withdrawn from the trial for, 26% in the docetaxel group compared to 20% in the mitoxantrone group. The key point I want to make there with regards to mitoxantrone is that patients uh, who may not tolerate docetaxel chemotherapy still may benefit from mitoxantrone, so it's still part of the armamentarium for metastatic hormone refractory prostate cancer patients. The other trial that came out in the New England Journal that year in 2004 was SWOG 9916, the Southwest Oncology Group trial. And what they were looking at was rather than docetaxel in isolation, they took docetaxel and estramustine combination and compared it with the, the standard for the trials, which is mitoxantrone and prednisone. This is a phase three trial again, slightly smaller, 674 patients. The two arms were docetaxel and ustramustine every three weeks compared with mitoxantrone every three weeks. Overall survival, similar difference between uh, this and this, the TAX327 trial, 17.5 months compared with 15.6 months for the mitoxantrone group. Significant uh, finding, though, is that there was a 15% incidence of adverse effects in the group that got estramustine. 15% of them suffered grade 3 or higher cardiovascular clotting events. Because of the similar survival data between this and the other trial, estramustine was thought to not add anything to the group, and so most people aren't using estramustine as first-line chemotherapy at this point. Dr. McLaughlin, question. Were there two months of quality of life months, or did the drug affect them that much? Pardon me? Did you get two months difference the quality of life? There was a quality of life benefit based on questionnaire data as well. So the summary of the taxing data, which has happened over the last couple of years, and we've heard uh, at, at meetings again and again, but I hope I've pointed out some points that uh, sometimes we uh, uh, weren't emphasized uh, over the last couple of years. The US FDA approved the regimen of docetaxel every three weeks in combination with prednisone for the treatment of advanced prostate cancer. So let's talk about where all this fits in when you have a patient in your office with metastatic prostate cancer and you're wondering, can I help them live longer? Can I help them feel better? These are the three groups that we talked about originally. Who do we treat, how do we treat them, and when do we treat them? Here's an algorithm for these patients, starting at the top, where if they have a hormone-naive prostate cancer, of course, you start your patients on androgen uh, deprivation therapy. If they progress, then you can consider second-line hormone therapy, either by withdrawing an antiandrogen if they're on an antiandrogen or adding an antiandrogen if they're not already, as well as second-line uh, hormone agents like ketoconazole. If they're progressing with a rising PSA uh, and they have biochemical only disease based on evaluation with a bone scan uh, or CT scan if indicated, if they have a slow PSA doubling time, most people generally agree anywhere six to eight months or greater their PSA doubling time, these patients are often followed. If they have a rapid PSA doubling time on the order of six to eight months or less, then these patients may be good patients for clinical trials. If they're asymptomatic and they have a positive bone scan, many people are putting these patients on zoledronic acid at this point because it's very well tolerated, even better than the chemotherapeutics, and patients have been shown to have benefit from zoledronic acid. At this point, most people, most urologists are not putting their patients on docetaxel, but if we think about all the patients that were asymptomatic that did show a benefit on subset analysis, some of that uh, uh, data is starting to be published, the subset analysis from the docetaxel trials, even patients that are asymptomatic with no pain do benefit from a survival and a quality of life point of view. So the push is towards earlier taxane-based chemotherapy in these patients and not waiting until they're symptomatic, which is the, uh, the area at the bottom here of the algorithm. These patients, uh, most 
uh, urologists put them on zoledronic acid as well as docetaxel if they can tolerate it, refer them to medical oncology. If they can't tolerate docetaxel, keep in mind that they still may benefit from mitoxantrone chemotherapy. And again, radiation or uh, strontium radioisotopes if they have diffuse bony metastasis. But uh, the, the key point of all of this is that patients may benefit from treatment earlier. We're going to talk a little bit now, second section, uh, just briefly about chemo resistance. Here's a picture during the snowstorm last week. That's uh, uh, Jeff Gatto there on a motorcycle. He helped me take a picture uh, with a sign for the resistance portion of the slide. Let's look uh, at chemotherapeutics and how they work and get a general understanding of what areas we may be targeting uh, with second-line treatments. Uh, and chemoresistant disease. Chemotherapeutics uh, uh, can be classed into a group of anti-metabolites like 5-FU or methotrexate, which act to inhibit purine or pyrimidine synthesis as DNA is replicated. Uh, another type of uh, chemotherapeutic category is the intercalating agents, which are genotoxic agents uh, binding and damaging the DNA or the enzymes involved in DNA synthesis. Cisplatin is a good example of that. Methotrexate, or a uh, sort of mitoxantrone that we talked about, is an example of an intercalating agent binding to the grooves of the DNA and preventing DNA replication through damage. Spindle poisons, which is uh, uh, inhibitors of the mitotic spindle, which allow the chromosomes to separate during division, that's on the bottom right there, is the group that the taxanes fall into, docetaxel chemotherapy, paclitaxel chemotherapy, or spindle poisons. This diagram shows uh, the tubulin subunits, which help the chromosomes to separate on the top left here, uh, as they polymerize and form the spindle in order to separate the chromosomes, docetaxel binds to an agent called beta tubulin, and that prevents them from separating after chromosomes. So it prevents depolymerization and prevents cell separation. Estramustine helps with that by binding to some of the microtubule associated proteins, and both of them prevent the spindle from separating the chromosomes. And so what you get is uh, interruption in metaphase and apoptosis as a result of the failure of these to separate. This is a list just to, to get a general idea of all of the different uh, uh, mechanisms of chemo resistance, and uh, many of these are under investigation right now for chemo resistant disease, both in the prostate cancer and in other oncology uh, uh, cancers. Um, altered membrane transport, such as MDR gene encoding the P glycoprotein, MRP1, which efflux uh, chemotherapeutics out of the cell. Altered target enzymes like mutated topoisomerase 2, uh, which helps with uh, DNA uh, uh, separation uh, and replication. Uh, decreased drug activation. Increasing drug degradation, such as altered expression by drug metabol uh, metabolizing enzymes. Drug inactivation due to conjugation with uh, glutathione and other proteins. Subcellular redistribution. Drug interaction. Enhanced DNA repair. Failure of apoptosis as a result of mutated cell cycle proteins, such as tumor suppressor protein P53, as well as upregulation of cell stress survival proteins, such as clusterin and HSP27, which is uh, uh, the work that the lab that uh, I've been fortunate to be a part of has been working on. The third section, we're moving on to second-line therapies under development for patients failing docetaxel chemotherapy. And I'm going to look at three agents that are under development as second-line treatments for patients failing docetaxel. Satraplatin is the first. Epotholones will be the second. And then I'll talk about OGX011, a cluster in antisense, uh, and show you some of the work that I've been involved in the lab last year. Satraplatin is uh, developed by Spectrum Pharmaceuticals. It's a third generation oral platinum based compound. There was a phase three study looking at satraplatin with prednisone. Uh, this is as first line treatment, which showed that there was an increase in progression free survival, 5.2 months versus 2.5 months. This is for second line treatment, or for first line treatment, sorry. This trial was prematurely closed due to sponsorship difficulty, and that was for first line chemotherapy. There is a phase three trial that is evaluating satraplatin with prednisone as second line therapy in patients with hormone refractory prostate cancer. So these are docetaxel failures. And there was an improvement in median progression free survival from 11 weeks to 9.7 weeks. Fairly minimal. That's one of the problems with this so far. Um, the survival data available in fall 2007. There are some unresolved issues with satraplatin for use as a second line chemotherapeutic. One is that progression-free survival was the primary endpoint based on bone scans and pain progression. 
progression-free survival is a controversial as a surrogate marker for metastatic hormone refractory prostate cancer. So the ultimate evidence is going to be in the survival data, which isn't available yet. And many skeptics, and, and fair enough, would say that 9.7 versus 11 weeks is statistically significant because of the size of the trial, but it's quite questionable clinically. Um, so it's been submitted for fast-track review, but uh, survival data will determine the outcome of, of this agent. Epophalones, here's a, a, a picture of the, uh, the bacteria. It's uh, uh, from the Myxobacterium, and uh, Syrangium cellulosum is the picture of the, uh, the bacteria that produces this. It's a naturally occurring compound of the epothalone class, and it's demonstrated preclinical activity in a number of taxane-resistant prostate cancer cell lines. As mentioned, it's derived from that bacteria that we showed, and originally it was isolated in South Africa off the shores of the Zambezi River. There's a picture of Victoria Falls there. Uh, I don't know if anybody got up to there. There's people who were in South Africa recently. Anybody see Victoria Falls? No? It's a little ways away, but uh, that's on the border of uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia. Wouldn't be a bad uh, research project to go and collect uh, epothalones from that area, I guess. So uh, uh, a semi-synthetic derivative of this uh, naturally occurring agent is ixapbepalone, um, and it's been uh, being developed by Bristol Myers Squibb and is under development. This agent was originally identified as an antifungal and noted to have potent cytotoxicity against multiple cell lines. It's similar to the taxines in that it's a tubulin polymerizing agent. Uh, the advantage of it from a, a, a preclinical point of view in the lab compared to uh, dust taxol is that it's less susceptible to P glycoprotein mediated drug efflux. So there's some uh, uh, basic science rationale why it may be helpful for chemo resistant patients. In phase two trials, they showed that PSA response rates for the single agents was 33 to 48% and in combination with estromustine, 69%. Phase two trials have so far been disappointing for this though as a second line agent um, uh, singly, it only showed modest activity when compared to mitoxantrone, prednisone. Now I'm going to talk about uh, clusterin antisense oligonucleotide, OGX011, and show you some of the data that I was involved in last year uh, in the lab. Uh, there's been uh, uh, many uh, studies and publications so far looking at clustering antisense in phase one and phase two trials, showing safety and efficacy in terms of gene downregulation. What the data I'm going to show you is specifically with uh, docetaxel resistant uh, disease and looking at OGX011 as a second line therapeutic. This is a diagram indicating the rationale behind antisense technology as DNA produces mRNA to express and produce a protein. Antisense oligonucleotides are single stranded DNA which are complementary to the mRNA strand of the target gene which inhibit translation. Whereas in many drug uh, therapeutics, you need to know the mechanism of action and the site of action on the protein in order to block that, that activity. With antisense technology, if the uh, particular function of the protein of interest is not completely defined, you can still downregulate its expression and downregulate activity. Clusterin is a cytoprotective chaperone protein that regulates the activity of several key apoptosis regulatory molecules. In association with hormone refractory prostate cancer, it induces a resistant phenotype towards treatment with androgen ablation, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. The work that I was involved in uh, uh, was uh, involving development of a chemo -resist docetaxel chemoresistant cell line. The panel on the left shows the uh, wild type or PC3 cell line. This is an androgen independent cell line. The one on the right is a, a picture of the morphology of the chemoresistant cell line. When looking at the cells, uh, many of them were quite large, giant cells with multinucleated cells. So you can see a visible difference on serial exposure to docetaxel chemotherapy and the development of this chemoresistant cell line, that they were a different group of cells. The uh, chemoresistant cell line designated PC3R were multidrug resistant to mitoxantrone, to docetaxel, and to paclitaxel-based therapy. As an example there in the middle, you can see docetaxel uh, an IC50, or the amount of drug that killed 50% in a tissue culture vial, was 64 nanomolars in the wild type PC3 cell line and 1,350 nanomolars, so significantly more chemo resistant after serial exposure to docetaxel chemotherapy. This is a Western blot looking at protein expression of clusterin in the far left panel at the top there see if I can get the pointer. Here is the amount of protein, that clusterin protein, produced in that androgen-independent PC3 cell line. And if you serially expose the cells to docetaxel chemotherapy over time, 
This is five nanomolars of docetaxel serial exposure. Clusterin is chronically elevated in this resistant cell line, and that's what the pink in this graph is showing. In the slide, we're also looking at other uh, cytoprotective proteins like HSP27, but there was no increase in uh, serial exposure to other chaperones that we looked at. In the lab, uh, we looked at whether we could downregulate clusterin expression by using this antisense agent. Um, here's the PC3. Um, you can definitely downregulate here. Here's the uh, antisense, much less protein than in the wild type here. And it was sequence specific. If you mix matched uh, an agent, an antisense agent, which, uh, which is a random scramble in terms of its target, um, you would not downregulate. This is also true in the resistant cell line. Here's the decrease in protein by giving that antisense agent compared to the wild type. Again, cluster much higher in the resistant cell line as compared to the wild type. This graph indicates in the, the tissue culture whether you could sensitize these cells to docetaxel chemotherapy. The blue here is the wild type. So these are the normal PC3 androgen-independent cell line. Docetaxel chemotherapy concentration down here and cell proliferation. So decrease in these graphs here is cell killing. You can see that the solid blue line compared to the dotted blue line indicates sensitization of the wild-type cell line to docetaxel chemotherapy. And here's the chemoresistant here. And again, with antisense clusterin, you could sensitize these cells to chemotherapy. That's also true in mitoxantrone, showing similar data here. This is the in vivo model, looking at subcutaneous xenografts in mice. And uh, again, similar color scheme. The blue represents the wild type PC3s implanted under the skin of the mice and looked at what happened to their growth over time. All of the groups growing here. The dotted line is with the antisense and chemotherapy in the wild type PC3 lines. And here, the solid blue line is without antisense treatment. The same thing is true in the resistant cell lines here in that antisense sensitized these and made the subcutaneous xenografts grow at a much slower rate than those not treated with antisense. This is the mitoxantrone graph showing similar, although mitoxantrone had a less effect on the subcutaneous xenografts. Conclusions of the preclinical data with uh, antisense uh, clusterin at looking at docetaxel chemoresistant cell lines as a second line treatment is that clusterin can confer a chemoresistant phenotype and that OGX011, the clusterin antisense, may be useful in enhancing the effects of cytotoxic chemotherapy in patients with hormone refractory prostate cancer who progress after first line docetaxel chemotherapy. Clinical trials evaluating the role of OGX011 in combination with docetaxel or mitoxantrone will soon begin, looking to see whether there's clinical uh, potential for this. So that's the end of my talk, and I'm going to open up to questions. I'd like to thank a number of people, um, Dr. Gleave and Dr. So, for their help in uh, the lab and welcoming into their lab group and a uh, great experience that I had there. Dr. Goldenberg, uh, who, uh, in association with the other two, is uh, my clinical supervisor for the year.